So with, um, with the way we'll be learning to make these apps, we're going to employ HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So all together, these sorts of concepts. HTML is what we would call the presentation, I'm sorry, the structure layer. Uh, again, I'm writing a few notes over here, not that many, but I'll write these, I'll put these notes into the folder. We'll use HTML, CSS, JavaScript to develop our apps. Those languages will then be translated, basically. To the native code. iOS traditionally would use Objective C, now more and more Swift. Android would use Java. And Windows would use C sharp. Three big languages. So if you build your app in Android native code, Java and then you want to tap into the iPhone market, you have to reprogram your app in Objective-C. It's another language. Then you want to tap into the Windows Marketplace, C-sharp. Traditional method. One language for every platform. It's a lot of effort to then go from platform to platform. Our method, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. HTML plus CSS plus JavaScript. JavaScript and Java are not the same, even though they share a root word. The people that in, the team that invented JavaScript, from what I understand, simply wanted to piggyback on the popularity of Java. Like, hey, this cool Java language, let's make our own thing called JavaScript. But it has nothing to do with each other. So if you're a Java pro, you're not a JavaScript pro, and vice versa. Although every the more languages you know, the more the better you are at thinking like a programmer to accomplish your goals. So this is different. What we'll do eventually in part two, all of that stuff times Cordova equals mobile app cross platform mobile app Cordova something we'll look at extensively next month. You can go look it up right now and read as much as you want, but that's basically a translator. The shortest answer is the translator. Actually, it's a web wrapper and all of that, but it's a translator that takes this code and makes it basically the native code of every language for you. I don't have to learn Objective-C or Java or C-sharp. I know these common web languages that we teach here in IMCP, in Feud, etc., on your own, in books. You learn these languages, and then with what we'll learn of Cordova next month, that will package it to every platform. That's the big goal and secret uh, of this class. This class, I've taught it for four years now. Uh, spring semester 2013. Little by little I've refined it. I've improved it. The software has improved also. I've uh, made it better every semester. So honestly, every time I teach this class, it's better than the last because I always add more to it. I learn more stuff too. I then bring it to you to be more efficient and effective. Um, we obviously have to start with our baby steps, a little bit of basic coding right now, and then we'll get more powerful soon. But that's what eventually we'll get to. Does that make sense? Any questions on this general concept? Yes. The advantage of using the native code is depending on your kinds of apps, it might be more efficient because this needs to be translated to this, so it's slightly less efficient. But it really only matters in games and other, you know, graphically intense and computationally intense apps. You know, uh, Facebook and such could technically run with those kind of languages. It doesn't need the advanced uh, native code like a game 
So that's a big advantage there. More efficient. What does it mean in 2009? What does it mean what? 2009? 209. Where? It's the 9-6. Yeah, 9-6. Oh, in this lab, in this room. In this, oh, room we've, awesome. in this room, we've got Notepad, but at home you can use other software. Okay. I'm in here so much, I just, I just call it 209. Um, so this is what our goal is eventually. You can go look up the Cordova website and get, get some knowledge before we get to it, but we'll do it together. That'll be part two. So uh, Notepad++ plus plus, never used by any of these things. You could. You could use Notepad to edit these other languages. But these languages often have their own specialized software. But we could use Notepad or these other ones too, to some degree. And what about the Google? What aspect of Google? Google Mobile. I'm sure it's got a lot of other complex <coughs> code like Ruby and uh, what else? React, JS, and lots of languages. So is there any way that we can trans or anybody can translate Notepad++ plus plus to the other languages? Um, people create uh, the software for a purpose, and since there are other software that might already do it, there's not much uh, of an incentive for people to translate it, I guess. All right, so if we get back to our code, June 13th, here's what we've got so far. It's plain old HTML. And what I was saying a moment ago is that we have the, um, the structure layer. We have the aspect of our code that focuses on structure. Then we have an aspect of the code that focuses on presentation. So that's each of these languages has a purpose. HTML structure layer, CSS presentation layer, JavaScript behavior layer, so HTML we're using it to define our basic content Here's a paragraph, here's a link, here's a picture. For that, in order for that paragraph to look nice, to change the font, to change the color, to add a drop shadow to the picture, CSS. In order for us to get feedback, we often have a form. We create a form in HTML. We make it look nice in CSS, but we make it do something in JavaScript. JavaScript is the behavior. It lets us actually do something, technically JavaScript. So HTML, hypertext markup language. Invented in around 1989. CSS, cascading style sheets. I believe 1996 or so. So it took a while before a language was invented to be able to make our websites look nice. There had been ways to color text and to align text and all of that, but they were clunky. There was not the right language for the right task. In the mid-90s, we got CSS as a way to change colors, alignment, make columns, drop shadows, all of that. And then uh, JavaScript from 1994, which does not stand for anything, but it's the name JavaScript around those dates. So those are the languages that we will be using. Let's play a little bit with CSS. We've written a little HTML to kind of make a structure of a project. It looks very boring. That's where CSS comes in. We'll change colors. Maybe do special effects and such. And then finally, JavaScript will for it to do something. If you go back to our code, there are several ways to write CSS and JavaScript. For, for the beginner, 
day one, we will write it the least efficient way, but the one that is the most obvious. Then we will write it more efficiently and better. Let's say I want to change the background color of my project. The main visible part of the project is inside of body. All of this text that appears in the viewport is inside of body. The default behavior, the default design of the body tag then is a plain white background. I want to redefine the background color of body, so we will use CSS. We will add a style attribute to body to change it. We have href attribute, target attribute, we have style attribute for CSS. Again, if you've taken the other classes, Feud especially, you know there's better ways to do this, but we'll get there. We're going to add inside of the body tag, so make sure you're inside of the angle brackets style attribute, which gives us uh, the ability to start using CSS. We're about to attach CSS to the body to redefine the look of the background color of the body. <clears throat> Style attribute. And then um, style property. Background dash color. When do we capitalize or use dashes or spaces and all of that? Again, a book that steps you very, very basically is useful, but I'll mention it I'll, and I'll point it out to uh, CSS, for example. We have multiple words separated with dashes. There's a CSS property, there's a CSS code, background color. Again, a book like this gives you all of the possibilities. You just need to look up the right one that you need. Colon, space, and then a color. Let's say red. Semicolon. I'm affecting the style of the body, changing the background property to the red value. I'll write those in notes in a moment. Let's save it and run it, and you'll see that you no longer have a plain white background. You have an eye-searing red color as your background. Perfect for Halloween. So I'll make some notes right now. Style attribute, background, CSS background property, CSS background value. Values, properties and values of CSS. CS style CSS attribute with red value of background color property. There's these keywords, there's this jargon properties, values, tags, elements, objects. There's all this jargon in any programming language. You can try to memorize it in the beginning or you can use it as necessary and I think that helps it stick better. So, attribute, background property, red value. If you don't like red, you may have, we have a bunch of other colors we can choose from. Beige. It's a little uglier than I thought it would be, but beige. We have a bunch of colors that are named. We also have color formulas that we can do. We have, I think, about 114 named colors, like purple. It's purple. Periwinkle. Periwinkle. Thistle. Thistle. 
Hmm. Very, very, very light blue. Chartreuse. How about this one? Anyone want to know bisque? Bisque is a soup. So bisque color. Yes. Excuse me. Uh, this type here is not is black. You you are red. It's supposed to be red. Uh, if you typed the rest of the code properly, you may be missing um, some other tag somewhere else. It's supposed to be red, just like I have red for href and target. So check the code around everywhere to make sure that it's also the same color as mine. So we have various uh, colors that we can use there. Uh, we can also define colors in, in a formula instead of a named color. Uh, we can, of course, look those up, or we can check the book that's got the list of them. But let's say my company color, my company's a red, but it's not that red. It's a specific formula. I can instead write RGB, open close parentheses, and write here a formula based on red, green, and blue. So I can say 100 units of red, 20 of green, and uh, 200 of blue in that order, which is a kind of a purple. There I have 100 units of red, 20 of green, 20 of blue, purple or reddish color. The red is stronger than the other colors. Now the problem that I'm seeing here, maybe I chose a perfect background color, but my text color is very hard to see. The text over here, maybe it'd be better in white or some other color. So we can further write our style code here to define our text color. So we've got the background color property at the end of the semicolon space. I'm going to add another property. Those semicolons are sort of like dividing. Do this, do that, do this. So if we have background color, it wouldn't make sense to have text color, right? It would make too much sense. It's not actually text color. When this was being invented in 1996, the committee never said, let's call text color the property. They decided color means text color. So there's background dash color for the background color, but then color is for the text color. You can type white, semicolon. And now I have much more readable text. Did clients send you like RGB? Did you have to do that a lot when you were making websites? A little more often we use hexadecimal colors, hex colors, because there's it's also less to type. That's what I figured. <laughs> That's when you put that in, I was like, the clients send you like this is how we want you to do it. No, and they don't even send the hex color either. They just said, I want a yellow color. So then you have to figure out with the client which version of yellow. We pull out a color swatch book and we pick the right color, usually in hex. One reason I like to do RGB is then you can throw in RGBA and do transparency. Uh, that's half visible. Uh, with hex, it, the default is no transparency. There's RGBA, alpha, for transparency. The last value is between 0 and 1. 0 is completely invisible, 1 is fully visible, and everything in between, like 0 0.75, 75 75% visible. So if there were colors on top of colors, it would look better. But here now my background color is Let's make it obvious, 25%. There it is there. I'm seeing the white behind that. So 
before and after. Now, if you had the hex up, you would just you put an opacity in the same thing? Like you could, but the problem with opacity is that it affects the whole element, not just the one tag you're trying to affect. Oh, I can't run it. <laughs> All right. So there are benefits of putting it in this bathroom. Okay, so here um, we redefine the body a little bit via style. We can use style on every other tag. And again, this is not the most efficient way to do it. A better way is a style block declaration, which we will get to, of course. But just to keep kind of playing with this, let's say now I want to change the look of Hello World. I change the default look of body with background color and color. I can do the exact same thing with Hello World by adding style. So let's try that. Inside of heading 1, I will add style to Hello World. Style, background color. Let's do um, brown, semicolon, color of text, bisque. So we can add CSS to any element directly like this or more efficient ways later. But we are able to control any aspect of our HTML. Now, the big difference here, this was boring just a moment ago. There's before, there's after. Less boring looking. And we're able to do other, other things, other special effects. Maybe I want a drop shadow uh, or a glow. Maybe this text here is too close to the edge. I'd like a little bit of spacing, the margins or the padding and such. All of that we can affect via CSS because the purpose of CSS is the presentation layer. We have the structure right there. And we have the presentation. We have the way to, to uh, style it. And again, there are 200 tags or code of CSS. I, you don't need to memorize them all. You can look them up as necessary. How do I do a drop shadow? Look up CSS drop shadow, and you'll find the answer. You don't have to have it all memorized. A good book or online will help you find all of your answers. It's good to memorize them as much as possible, the ones you're going to do over and over, but you don't need to memorize every tag. How many of you have ever used the Q tag in HTML? There you go. You don't, you don't need that tag. It's for a very specific thing. It's a, I believe it's a quotation. Uh, so you've got the right tag for the right task. Let's add a picture to the document, and then we'll style it a little bit. So we've got uh, that first paragraph, second paragraph. Let's create a third paragraph. A new paragraph after the previous paragraph. So paragraph can contain one sentence, sure. And in this case, we're going to create a picture. Part of the reason to use paragraphs is that they are block-level elements. 
that separate themselves from other elements. It'll make more sense later. Block level, inline level elements. But basically, I want this picture to be separated from the other content, so I put it in a paragraph. We've got a tag here, IMG. Image. And the purpose of this tag is to display a picture. Well, this needs a few attributes. What's the picture? So inside of the image tag, we add src equals the source of this image. We can link to a picture that's on this computer, on your computer, or we can link to a picture that's online. We have a few uh, sample pictures on these computers. This work that I've been doing, I've, I've written it and I've saved it on the desktop. There, there it is on the desktop. So I want, I'll want i show you where the sample pictures are, but I want to copy a sample picture and put it on the desktop where the code is so that I can link it from the code to the picture. We've got a few sample pictures. If you go to the desktop and open up computer window, on the left side, on the left pane, we have pictures, we have sample pictures. A few pictures ready for us to use. I'm going to get the koala picture. So I'm going to copy the koala picture and paste it to the desktop where I have my my file. You may have it on your flash drive, wherever you saved your work, your file. I put the koala picture next to it, and then I'll write the code to use the picture. Basically, on that src that we just wrote, we simply write the name of the file. And technically, you should write it as a capital letter, because the picture most likely has a capital letter. Capitalization does matter, especially when we get more complex with CSS and JavaScript. So this is Koala with a capital K. If I go back to my code, image source equals Koala JPG. This should work because we've got the picture in the same folder as the code. They're both on the desktop. I would have to write a different path to the picture if it was still in the sample pictures folder. A more complex path. There's a picture. Very big. It's a big koala. CSS can be used to affect colors, like we saw, but it can also be used to affect sizes and other elements. So I'm going to use CSS to change the size of this picture. It's too big. So we've got image with a source attribute. Next I'll add a style attribute. We have a property of width, colon, space, and do 250px, semicolon. Again, the syntax of CSS, of style. Some property, colon, some value, semicolon. Technically, you don't need that space in between, but I like the look of the space. To separate. And then we can add a height. Height colon space, do 100px, semicolon. If you run that, you've resized your koala picture. 
badly, but you've resized it. So now the picture looks like that. It looks like the Terminator at the end of Terminator Part 1. So width and height. Um, this definitely changed its size, but it distorted it. It distorted the pro proportions. Uh, one trick is if you only mention one of the dimensions or one of the sides, the other one will automatically change in proportion. So if I don't know what the proportion is, just set one value, often the width, and the height will scale in proportion. And there it is. So 250 wide is good, but then the height right there is better. While we're here, a couple of other things we can play with regarding CSS, design-wise. Uh, we can add a drop shadow. So we resize the picture, and I can add a drop shadow. In the old days, I would need to open up that picture in Photoshop, do a little graphical editing, resize it, and save it. Then it doesn't look very good in the design. So I have to go back to Photoshop, change it again, resave it, put it into my code again. With CSS, with a modern CSS, we can uh, make some of these effects right in the code without affecting the original image. We've got the width property of style. Here's another one. Let's add box-shadow colon space. This one is a little more complex, so we'll just write these values first, and then I'll explain them. We will write 5px space 5px space 5px space black semicolon. So the semicolon in CSS is basically end of statement. Box shadow statement end with statement end, and then the next ones. So you need that semicolon. We're doing box shadow. Save it and run it, then I'll explain those values. But that should create a drop shadow. Look at that. Easy. Now, technically, what we're using here is CSS3, the latest version of CSS. And this is CSS has been around a while, but we had a big concern a few years ago. This code is too new, too modern. Some browsers don't understand it. CSS has been around since '96 or so, and some of this newer code is, you know, from '98 or 2000 or whatever. So some uh, browsers might not understand it, so it would ignore it. And you may learn well if you use vendor prefixes and all of that. That's one way to accommodate it. But I always avoid vendor prefix prefixes. Uh, I focus on the standard of this code instead of trying to use the code specific to a browser. And ultimately, we are not targeting a browser. Eventually, we're targeting a device. So those vendor prefixes <coughs> don't matter there. If you don't know what I'm talking about vendor prefixes, don't worry. But if you know about vendor prefixes, again, don't worry. <clears throat> what I'm doing here is a drop shadow, 555. Five, five. Hopefully, as you go through this class, you don't just type what I type wrote. You also 
explore a little on your own. You check out the book. You, you think about, well, what happens if I do this? You make a change. It's a mistake. Undo. No problem. Well, you make a change, and then you figure something out new. So hopefully you're thinking outside the box and not just you know, copying and pasting what I do. So hopefully you think, well, what happens if I put a 15 there? You see that the drop shadow moved over to the right a little bit more. This first value is the x-coordinate to the right are higher values. For 55, it moves even more. The second value, if we put 25, that is the y-coordinate, and it moves over more. You tell me, if you put 55, what does that one do? Blends it in blend or blur more. Very blurry, way too blurry. If I had that like on 35. More blur. Down to 1. Very little blur. Like something like that. So blur value, x and y, and then color. Obvious, the third one. Pink. So if I want to move the shadow to the left, negative values. If I want to move the, the, the Y uh, up, negative values. It's a little opposite, maybe. So negative values of x move it up, because the starting point is the top left corner of the picture. Positive x moves to the right. Positive y moves down. Negative x, or negative y moves up. And negative x moves left. One trick you can do here is, well, what's between negative and positive? Zero. Zero. You can do zero here. You get a little glow effect. It's right behind the element. Zero, zero. Five pixels of blur in a red color. Like a red glow. So HTML and CSS. We had a very plain and humble document a little while ago, and now with some CSS it's a little more interesting looking. We will cover a lot more CSS, of course. And then the third piece of the puzzle is JavaScript. Let's touch on a little bit of JavaScript. This is the interactivity part. We're going to cover a lot of JavaScript as the three months goes on. But this is what will let your project do something. Right now it doesn't do anything. Let's say I will create a button that when you click on it, something happens. So we've got a tag to create a button. After the koala, uh, let's say after the image, we're going to create the button tag. button tag, and we will say click it. We have a tag for a task to create a button. If you check your result, you have a button. I would like the button below the image. We've learned at least one way to do that so far. How can I move this button below the image? Break. Either at the end of the image or at the beginning of the button. And 
anywhere where that tag is encountered, it will break the line. So now the button should appear on its own line. JavaScript is the hardest language we'll learn in this class. 500 pages for two languages. 600 pages for one language. So that's how the order of it. HTML is easy. It's half, less than half of the book, of the first book. The second half, a little bit more than the second half, is CSS. A little harder. The hardest one is JavaScript, meaning more can go wrong. So we're going to spend a lot of time debugging and figuring out our broken code. Because the HTML, you just learned the tags to do the thing. I just made a button, the end. I know how to make a button. To style it and all of that, I need to learn how to change its radius and color and all of that. Not so hard. To make it do something, that's the hard part. JavaScript is hard because uh, you have to learn the right tag, the right code, and then you have to make it do what you want it to do. We're going to suffer syntax errors, and we're going to suffer logic errors. Syntax errors will be easy to fix. I wrote the code wrong. It's a syntax error. That's easy to find. Logic errors are harder to find. I set it up to press a button to create a random number, and something does not happen. Whoops, I typed it logically wrong. I put a greater than instead of a less than, and the condition didn't work. Broken code. Syntactically correct, logically wrong. That's another reason why JavaScript is hard. A lot of code to learn, and a lot of logic to deal with. <clears throat> We're going to um, write some code to make this button do something. And we've seen an examples here of writing CSS directly on the tag to change it. This is known as inline coding. It's not the best way to do it, but it's an obvious way to do it as a beginner. We can do the same sort of thing with JavaScript and write inline JavaScript. But that's the one definitely I don't even want to teach you. Don't learn inline JavaScript. It's way too much trouble. We're going to learn embedded JavaScript and then later external JavaScript. I want to write JavaScript to affect that button. I've written code for a paragraph, for a style, etc. I've got a block of body, a block of head. I can make a block for JavaScript before the end of body. New line. We'll type the tag script, open and close. A couple of separate lines. This will be our central location for all our JavaScript. We can do that also for CSS. Right now, we've made it easy that I've attached CSS to elements, and I've got very few elements to work with. But when we create a complex project with multiple screens, multiple pages, we don't want to do inline style like this, because we have to search all of our code to find the one example that we need to change. Later, we can write embedded style in its own little block. Later, I want to avoid right away an inline JavaScript. I want to write embedded JavaScript. Not write inline JavaScript. Write embedded. D's and embedded. Two D's? One D? Embedded or external JavaScript. We'll do external later, of course. It's harder to maintain inline code. You have to find the right line and edit the line. If you put all your code in a central location, that's a lot easier to maintain. That has pros and cons that we'll deal with later. What we're going to do is write some JavaScript here. Here now is you know, 500 possible JavaScript commands that we could do. You don't have to have them all memorized. You have to know how to look them up when you need them. We have this JavaScript command, confirm. Now we'll do this one instead, prompt. 
the syntax is often something like this. Some sort of keyword of JavaScript, perhaps with parentheses, semicolon. Semicolon, I remember that from CSS. In CSS, it was a terminating character, basically. You ended with. In, in JavaScript, it's very similar, and it's often at the end of every line, or statement. So I'm using the prompt JavaScript command, end of statement. Inside of the parentheses, in quotes, open, clo open quote, end quote, we'll type enter your name. Save it and run it, and see what happens. Okay, so if you type that properly, you save it and run it. Oh, right away it popped up. I never pressed anything. I'll explain why in a moment, of course. But it popped up. Enter your name. That's nice. A whole login system simply with that one command. So I'll type Victor. I'll click OK. Nothing else happens. This is the part where we realize computers are dumb. They don't know what we want. You have to tell it exactly via programming what you want. This simply made a pop-up. It doesn't do anything with that name. <coughs> Nothing else happens until you write a few more dozen or hundred lines of code. So this is where the logic errors will happen. I know the right code, but it's not doing the right thing. And that's where we spend a lot of time debugging and troubleshooting our code. What's happening here is we've got all of this code, in my case, 36 lines. When I run it in the browser, it starts from the top and goes to the bottom, interpreting every line, processing every line from top to bottom, the web browser. Later on, the, the device it's going to process all the code top to bottom. It eventually gets down to JavaScript. It sees this command and it executes it because it was never set up in a way to work by clicking the button first. So this again, the complexity of JavaScript. That's the right code. No syntax errors. Logic errors. I want to click the button to launch the prompt uh, command. For the moment, I'm going to comment. I'm going to deactivate the prompt code. It's not quite complete. Uh, in JavaScript, we don't use the HTML comment. We use the JavaScript comment. There's two of them. One of them is simply a double slash that deactivated this line. The other way is if you wrap a slash, asterisk, and then asterisk slash, it's like the multi line. What's that? It's like CSS? Uh, it uses CSS syntax as well, but it uses an opening and a closing tag, like HTML. Or a quick way to just deactivate that one line, double slash, at the beginning. So that, that is off. If I run it, the prompt doesn't appear again. I want to click the button to then run that code. So the JavaScript needs to know, we mean that button. We mean that element. This is the complexity then. If you notice, the, the book that I recommend is called, J, is called JavaScript and jQuery. JavaScript, plain old JavaScript, invented in about 1994 is a way to manipulate the code. But it also has you know, hundreds of possible uh, commands. There is then sort of shortcuts with jQuery. We will see that with jQuery, we will be able to write JavaScript even faster. We will use plain JavaScript in the beginning, and then we will use jQuery later for shortcuts. 
the motto of the jQuery project is write less, do more. So first, in order to simply set up this button to be clickable, we have to write a bunch of code to trigger it to do the prompt. And later with jQuery, we'll be able to write it even faster and more efficient. So this button, in order for us to identify it in JavaScript, needs an attribute to identify it. So let's back up to the button, id attribute. This now has, this will now have a unique identifier so that via JavaScript we know which button we're referring to because we can have seven buttons in on the page and one way to target a button is with an ID. We'll call this BTN click. This unique identifier that I'm making up right now I could call this kitty cat. And if I write my code properly, it'll work. I want button click. I'm making up a unique name, a unique identifier for the button. It's very common when you have multiple words in JavaScript to have the capital letter as the second word. So here, click, I have it capitalized. If I, if I had this called something like my button, that, that would work, but it's getting a little hard to read. Um, I don't want to do my space button. That's completely wrong in this case. I could do my dash button. That works. But it's often common to do capital letters. BTN click. I've identified this element in HTML so that I can use it in JavaScript. In the JavaScript block, we're going to reference an HTML element in JavaScript. JavaScript is an object-oriented programming language. If you don't know what that means yet, it will make sense later. But we're going to create a variable, var. We're going to create a JavaScript object to target an HTML element, var for variable. You can think about it as a container. I call this el for element, btn click. I did a capital B there because it's the second word of my my name. This is allowing us to create a JavaScript object to be able to do all the things we can do in an object-oriented programming language. Variable, element, button click, space equals, so I'm creating an object like this. Uh, this can be an object, a container here. It contains things. So uh, this is the JavaScript variable, uh, lbtn, click. And inside of it is going to contain basically the HTML. That's the equals part here. Document dot. This is another keyword, another object. Document is up here, the HTML document. In the HTML document, we're going to find that button so that we can use it in JavaScript. Dot get element by ID. Notice the very specific spelling. A beginner does a capital I, capital D. That would have been great, but no, it's a lowercase. Get, lowercase, element, uppercase, by, uppercase. ID, uppercase I only. Very common mistake. We're basically saying in the HTML document, let's get an element by its ID. Open close parentheses. Like we have here, prompt open close parentheses. 
semicolon. Data element, which element? What we mean here? so that we can use it in JavaScript to eventually use that prompt. Quotes btn click. Kind of a long line, but later on with jQuery we will be able to shorten that because the less we type, the less errors we may have. Uh, so, okay, you got an element. The element in JavaScript is full of, basically, or is a reference to the button up here. Next line. LBTN. We can use this now as a shorthand for this. Dot add event capital E listener parentheses semicolon. There's a JavaScript element. We can have an event listener that's going to pay attention to something. A click, for example. Space, no space. Where? There's a letter before parentheses. No, some people put a space there. That's perfectly fine. I usually don't put spaces when it relates to the method or function and such. So on the event of something, like a click, do something else. In quotes, click. In the event of a click, basically. Have this object pay attention to a click. On the event of a click upon this object, which is a shorthand for this HTML element, up there, that button. <coughs> Comma inside of the parentheses. In the event of a click, do something. Fn log in. This is a built-in, it's a built-in reserved JavaScript command prompt. And I would like to simply use it up here, but what we're going to do is we're going to call a function, which is a collection, which could be a collection of commands. I want to ask for the person's name, and then store it in the database, and then play a sound. I don't want it to simply ask for the name. So a function is a collection of commands. I made up this function. Function fn login. And again, because of the multiple words, we've got capitalizations. Next line, define function. We need to explain. We just invented something. fn login, that's not a real JavaScript command. We invented it. It's a function. So we have to explain. Function, fn, login, open and close parentheses, space, open and close curly braces, which is shift square braces, which is next to the p on the backslash. Somewhere in the deep recesses of JavaScript, this prompt command is defined somehow. We can just use it, prompt. But we're inventing a command, fn login. So we have to define. This function means this. In this case, we don't put a semicolon at the end. It's just the way it is. When you, when you declare a function, we don't put a semicolon at the end of that line. 
If you put one, it won't cause a problem, but uh, you, you don't want a semicolon there. Uh, I'm going to go back to these curly braces here, and in between I'm going to break the curly braces into multiple lines. And all of this was to set up, click the button, ask the name. Lots of writing for something relatively simple. Again, that's why this is a 600-page book on one topic. This is why we're going to have trouble as we get more advanced. But you don't have to have all the commands memorized, just the ones you need. This code of prompt, I then actually want it in the function. <coughs> If you select it, you can cut and paste or <coughs> drag and drop. Drag and drop. If you select that code prompt, you can just drag it up here. So in Notepad, you can drag and drop code. This is, I don't want the comment. I can delete the comment now. But I wanted to ask your name from this function which we call, which we use, once there's a click on this object, which represents <coughs> this HTML node. Save it and run it. The prompt should not automatically appear anymore. Now it should be triggered by clicking the button. click the button, it pops up. Click and asks. If it didn't work, this is what we'll be doing with JavaScript debugging. I might have mistyped something. Syntax error. I might have typed it in the wrong place or, or the wrong way. Logic error. Raise your hand if it worked. How many of you got the pop-up after you clicked? Okay, good. Maybe a few people didn't. That's okay. We'll do... we'll wrap up in a moment and do help. If you see all of this, maybe all of that worked just fine. So when we got here, it didn't work. Well, we will use debugging techniques and tools to figure out where did our code go wrong. One way that uh, the debugging, one way that the web browser can help you is when you've got your code in the browser, you press F12 and that opens up the developer's console. And you may get messages here. And this mentions a character in coding, don't worry about that. But if it mentions other code, it may tell you, go check line 7. And it may tell you where your code is wrong. Do you think I can type my code wrong? It's very hard for me to do. Oh yeah, right here. So, I mistyped the code on purpose. Popped up syntax error, missing a parenthesis after argument list. Learn more. Check your line 36. In my case, it's telling me what line and column I may want to look at to see what I did wrong. When you click the button? Or you, you mean to see the result in the browser? What do you mean what icon? you go to run launch Firefox? So here's a very quick introduction to JavaScript. These three languages we will be writing throughout the course, and eventually these will be converted or packaged into a mobile app project. As we wrap up the main lecture, I usually take general questions, depending on the time we wrap up, usually by 9 o'clock, so we can have some lab time at the end for people to ask questions one-on-one. -on -one. I'm going to end the lecture in a moment. I'm going to put my version of the code thus far into the network folder. Uh, so you can compare if you'd like. If it worked, great. If not, we'll figure it out in a moment. But if it worked, it's still not done because, okay, what happens with asking a name? Nothing. That, that, 
that data just goes off to the ether. It just goes away. Nothing happens with it. We didn't store the data. We didn't process it. It just did it, but then the data went away. What comes next? General questions on what we talked about today or the class in general? Yes? It's not general. Okay, I'll be with you one moment. <laughs> with you one moment. General questions about the class? Yes? No, what, what I had said about seven was I may have seven buttons on the screen. How do I know which one this code targets? I use an ID to identify the particular button. Like Kitty Cat. Kitty Cat would work if I re if I named it ID Kitty Cat. Yeah. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this code into the network folder. And uh, we'll wrap up at this point, and if you need any help, you can call me over.